Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, Christy Frederick, or Fred as we like to call her, of Ocean's First Education is going to teach us how to explore the seafloor by creating our very own seafloor model. Shockingly hard to say seafloor, excuse me. <laughs> Fred will walk us, walk us through each step of this project. Um, we do not recommend that you attempt to create yours in parallel. She'll be moving through these steps a little too quickly to avoid frustration. Uh, after the webinar, we will email you a step-by-step -step PDF that Fred was kind enough to put together, as well as a link to this recording, so you can play and pause as needed while you work on your model. Um, we're also going to be taking questions, so if you have any questions at all, please add them to the chat box, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we are going to answer most of the questions at the end of the webinar. However, if you have any questions or need clarifications on the step that Fred's taking, uh, we'll do our best to address those in the moment. Um, and so now that our housekeeping is out of the way, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Fred. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to be here with you. As Kaylin said, my name is Chrissy Frederick. I'm an instructional designer with Ocean First Education located in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Most people call me Fred, so you're welcome to call me Fred as well if you're comfortable with that, or alternatively, you can call me Chrissy. I'm fine with either. At Ocean First Education, we firmly believe that marine science should be a part of the fundamental science curriculum. We think that because it is a wonderful way, a relevant and engaging way to incorporate basic tenets of earth, life, and physical science, as well as components of math, technology, and engineering into scientific ex exploration. Uh, we design developmentally appropriate online learning experiences for learners of all ages. So if you're interested in kindergarten through 12th grade, um, we even have some programs that are geared towards adult learners. So if you're interested in incorporating marine science into your learning experiences, the learning experiences with your uh, learners at home, please feel free to reach out to us at Ocean First Education or to me personally, and I'll, I'll get you our contact information um, in, just a, in just a second. Uh, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about the seafloor and about mapping the seafloor but I'd love to start off a little bit to create some context about the ocean in general and why studying the ocean is, is so, uh, so important. So I have some slides that I'd like to share with you. So hopefully this will work for me and I'll be able to share my desktop. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so as I said, um, my name is Chrissy Frederick, and um, most people call me Fred. You can see my contact information there on the screen, Chrissy at OceanFirstEducation.blue, and our website is uh, www.OceanFirstEducation.blue. So that is .blue, not .com, not .org. We like to incorporate the ocean and in, in even our, our digital presence. So today we're going to talk about mapping the seafloor. So we're going to use some easily obtained materials to simulate how scientists historically have mapped the seafloor and talk a little bit about how scientists map the seafloor today, the topography of the seafloor. And um, you might not realize that the topography of the seafloor is just as dramatic as anything that one might find on land. The tallest mountains on the planet actually start at the, at the ocean's floor and extend up above the surface of the ocean. The tallest mountain on the planet is actually Mauna Kea, which is one of the six volcanoes that have formed the island chain of Hawaii. It's about 33,000 feet tall, which is a little bit over six miles. That's it's about 0.7 miles taller than Mount Everest. The deepest place in the world is actually underneath the seafloor too. That's the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific, which is about, um, it's almost seven miles deep in its deepest part uh, at the Southern end of the trench called Challenger Deep. So really dramatic. And this is a, a fun and an interesting way to engage some science skills, some basic survey techniques, and some graphing. So we're going to do a little bit of line graphing, and then we're also going to do a contour map, specifically a bathymetric map um, in this activity. So as Kaylin said, uh, this is a preview. You'll get a procedure with the materials list at the end of the webinar, and this is something that you can incorporate at home. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me directly at my email, and you can always visit oceanfirsteducation.blue to see what other exciting marine science materials um, are available to you. 
So why care about the deep sea? Why care about the ocean in general? Why is it something that you might want to consider um, consider the importance of and incorporate into your scientific learning? So we're going to talk a little bit about that before we hop into the to the simulation to the activity. This is a pretty famous picture. Some of you have probably seen this before. It's called Earthrise. This was taken on the first manned mission to the moon in 1968. And when you look at this picture, you can really see that the Earth is a blue planet. We are the blue planet. A famed oceanographer, Dr. Sylvia Earle, said, no blue, no green, no water, no life. So the Earth, uh, the life support system of the Earth is truly the ocean. 50% of our atmospheric oxygen comes from photosynthesis by ocean producers. The ocean regulates our weather and climate, and it's a source of food for billions of people worldwide. So really, the ocean is what makes life as we know it possible on this planet. It's what makes our planet habitable. There's incredible biodiversity in the ocean. It's the largest habitat on the planet, the largest animal that ever has lived, the blue whale, lives in the ocean. The most abundant vertebrate on the planet is a deep sea fish you can see right here called the tan bristle mouth. We have incredible diversity of ecosystems in the ocean from hydrothermal vent communities like this one to the rainforests of the sea, which are coral reefs. Hydrothermal vent communities were unknown to scientists until the late 1970s. And when submersibles first viewed these, these deep sea communities, scientists were really surprised to see incredible diversity of life there. Because up until that point, it was thought that all energy from life came from the sun. And this is deep ocean where the sun doesn't penetrate. And so the producers in these hydrothermal vent communities don't do photosynthesis. They don't rely on the energy from the sun to make carbohydrate. They use energy from chemicals deep inside the earth, hydrogen sulfide, other things like that from volcanic activity to produce carbohydrate. And we also have organisms with incredible adaptations in the ocean, like deep sea organisms, the majority of which are bioluminescent, like this bioluminescent siphonophore, which is a type of colonial jelly. So incredible biodiversity in the largest habitat of the planet. Another reason to think about incorporating marine science into your, your scientific learning is the incredible technological innovation that comes from exploring the ocean. We have explored very little of the ocean, only about 5% of it to a depth of 10,000 meters, which is 6.2 miles. We actually know more about the surface of the moon than we know about seafloor topography. That's changing. You can see here are some of the technological ways that scientists explore the deep sea. We have submersibles, like this here is the submersible Alvin, which is run by Woods Hole. We have remote operated vehicles or ROVs. So these are um, robots that are tethered and controlled to, to the ship and controlled by a pilot. And you can see one here exploring a, a submarine wreck in the Gulf of Mexico. And then we even have AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, which are uh, free. They don't require being piloted. They're pre-programmed robots that are able to um, explore the ocean map and take pictures and do all those sorts of things. So really quite spectacular cutting edge uh, technology that's being used to explore the ocean and the deep sea. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about mapping the seafloor historically and, and what we're going to be doing today just to build some context and then looking in terms of how scientists do this currently. So the importance of mapping, really the, the main um, desire to map the seafloor first came from need to navigate. So you can see hundreds of years ago, uh, the mapping of the seafloor was done by a weighted line. So you can see we've got a line here. All these images are courtesy of the University of Hawaii Manoa. You can see this line here, it's, it's graduated, it's marked off with knots and then there's a weight and somebody would come over the side of the sailing ship and drop the weight down and the line down, the weight would carry the line down and when the, weight, when the line stopped running out because the weight hit the seafloor, they would stop and mark it and pull it up and mark depth. So that was historically how sailors would, would map the seafloor. And this was important because there were areas that were shallow, shoals, they needed to be able to avoid them. And this was, this was how they got that information. So quite time consuming, uh, quite effort intensive and, and really not very accurate. So in the 20th century with the advent of sonar, which stands for sound navigation and raining, ranging, um, using sound waves to be able to bounce them off something and then recording the time it takes for that sound wave to come back and being able to calculate the distance then. So in the 1950s, 
sonar was used to start mapping the seafloor. So we can see we have a ship here sending down a single beam of sonar. It's hitting the seafloor. It's echoing back. And again, if we know the speed that sound travels in water, which we do, that the, the speed that sound travels in water does vary based on salinity and temperature, but that's been very well figured out. So if we know temperature and salinity of water, we can figure out the speed of sound in that water, regardless of where we are. If we know that speed and we measure the time that it takes that echo, we can use math to figure out that distance. And so that single beam sonar. So what, what a ship would do would be to lay out a compass bearing and drive a transect down the, the transect line, like drive down that transect line and take these single beam sonar points and get these, these depth, these sounding uh, data. So sounding is making a measurement of something underwater, get these depth points at different points along a distance axis. So it's an, an, an X, Y grid, if you will, with distance of the transect being on the X axis and the depth being on the Y with sea level being here and then those depth measurements being negative numbers. And that's something that we're gonna to simulate today. We're gonna to simulate single beam sonar mapping of a seafloor model. Nowadays, sonar technologies are uh, much fancier than that. And scientists can do what they call swath mapping, which you can see here in this picture. Here's the ship. This is a, an ROV. You can see it's tethered to the ship. And this ROV is also driving a transect, but it's sending out multiple beams of sonar. So multi-beam sonar, we call side scanning sonar. And these multiple beams are going out and are able to map a swath up to 100 kilometers wide and giving us these really high definition maps of the seafloor. And this is important not only because it helps with navigation, but because as we learn more about the deep sea, we learn that that's a really important habitat for many different organisms. And so if we don't know what's there, we can't conserve it. Not only from a biodiversity standpoint, but there's also many resources that people are interested in using in the deep sea. So mapping the deep sea this way helps us better plan for the sustainable use of those resources. So that's a little bit about our mapping. What do some of these maps look like? What kind of maps are we gonna to make today? The easiest kind of map is this one here in the center. It's called a sonograph or an echogram. So you can see this is actually um, single beam sonar of, a, of the North Atlantic seafloor at a, 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 a profile of about 36 degrees North latitude. So here we see on the Y axis, this is distance. This is in kilometers. And here we have, I'm sorry, it's in meters. And here we have the depth. And you can see they took a single beam sonar. So you can see it started out relatively shallow and then it got deep. So it's simply plotting those depth measurements at each one of those distant points along the transect. And this is the type of mapping that we're going to start off simulating in today's webinar. When we get more data, then we can do something like this one over here, which is a bathymetric map. So a bathymetric map is a type of contour map for topography underneath the water, right? So a, a, a um, bathymetry. So topography is landforms above water, bathymetry is landforms below water. So you can see a bathymetric map is drawn using contour lines. So contour lines are lines that connect points of equal depth. And you can see each one of these contour lines, there's hundreds of them on this map, Right? Each one of these contour lines is connecting lines of equal depth. And then what was done is that it was then further color coded to show a contour range using warmer colors to indicate more shallow areas and cooler colors to indicate more deep, deeper areas. And we are going to um, take, we're going to start off by doing a single transect and using that data to make a sonograph. And then we're going to add some additional data. We'll run two more transects and take some additional data. And then we're going to use that to draw a contour map and then color code it with our ranges. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, this is the type of map that's able to be done through that swath mapping. So this is a computer model of the, of the Caribbean Sea. Um, this is actually this, this dark purple area showing the Puerto Rican Trench, which is the deepest area in the Atlantic Basin. It's a depth of over five miles. And so this is, the computer is putting together all that information from those, those hundreds of beams of sonar that are coming in and getting a really, really high, high definition image. And so those, this, is, this is really what scientists are able to do um, nowadays and really quite uh, fantastic imagery. 
All right. So let's just talk a little bit about seafloor topography, just the basics, because I, I don't know how much you know about names for different terms of the seafloor. So this image is courtesy of NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. They have wonderful educational resources dedicated to marine science. So that's another place to uh, look, at, look at if you're interested in incorporating some more marine science resources into your learning. Uh, NOAA actually has a research vessel called the Okinos Explorer that is fully dedicated to telepresence enabled ocean exploration. So when they're on an expedition, they have the ability to live stream videos from their submersibles and from their ROVs. So really, really cool. Uh, Okinos Explorer actually just wrapped up an expedition today. They were mapping seamounts in the North Atlantic and specifically looking at these seamounts as what they call stepping stones of habitat. Because in general, the open ocean tends to be a place, a little bit of a food desert. So these seamounts, these undersea mountains, aggregate fish and, and nutrients and um, become these little oases in the desert and looking at how these these seamounts spaced out in the North Atlantic might be making kind of a corridor of accessible habitat. So that's something to check out. Um, so here's a, a just a general map of sea floor topography. This just gives you some basic ideas. So here we have a continent and this shallow water right next to the continent we call the continental shelf. The water then usually becomes deep quickly. We call that the continental slope. And then the seafloor evens out. This relatively flat area called the abyssal plain, a small little hill called an abyssal hill. Here's one of those seamounts, those undersea mountains. And then you can see dropping down into an ocean trench. So these are some of the things that we're gonna see today when we take a look at our seafloor model. So hopefully, that gives you a little bit of a taste of why you might want to consider making the ocean your classroom, why you want to study the deep sea, and um, gives you a little bit of context for the importance of the ocean and how mapping has historically been done and what we're going to be doing today. So I guess I'll stop there. Um, and um, I'm going to grab my seafloor model and I'm going to show you guys my seafloor model and um, we can talk a little bit about how I made this. So I made this seafloor model using salt dough. So that was the method that I decided that I wanted to, um, to incorporate. And so if you're not familiar with salt dough, um, two cups of flour, one cup of salt, one cup of warm water, mix it all up. Um, it can get pretty sticky, it can get a little messy. Um, and I used this to make salt dough um, and um, I used a, um, a box a little bit bigger than a shoe box. And so a shoe box and some salt dough and you can make your own seafloor model. And this is a really fun way to kind of get a learner thinking about those, those, technolog those, those top topographical features that we just talked about. So really kind of engaging the learner in the process of like, well, how could you represent the continental shelf? How could you represent the continental slope? How could you, you know, make a trench? How could you represent the abyssal plain? How could you make a seamount? So, uh, that was really fun for me. I had a really good time making it. And um, I will say, if you're not familiar with Salto, it does take a little while for it to dry. I'm here in a very dry, um, warm climate here in Colorado. Um, so I left mine outside and it dried in, the ma in a matter of days, but it, it could take you longer. And so I made this model then to be able to use for the mapping. So the activity that I'm mostly going to show you today is the mapping activity. The activity that I'm going to show you today is the mapping activity, not necessarily how to make the model. Um, but if you're interested in getting um, advice about how I made mine, uh, feel free to email me. But I also think it's something that if you think about the topography of the seafloor, it's a really fun kind of design build challenge to, to have your, your learner make a seafloor model. There's really no wrong way to do it. Um, and I'll show you how I chose to do mine. So I'm going to turn this and I'm going to bend my camera down a little bit. So hopefully you can see that. All right. So hopefully you can see my seafloor model. I decided to color mine. And I'm sorry, I have a window that's coming right down here on my desk. So it might make it a little bit difficult to see if I add some light. Does that make it better? Um, no, it really doesn't. So, OK. So here's my seafloor model. So you can see I um, have a, a box that's a little bit bigger than a shoe box. I chose that because that's just what I happen to have. I would recommend um, that you, you know, try to use something that's around the size of a shoe box. And the reason for that is it's big enough that you can actually add some topography and see some change to the depth over time, but it's not so big that you're gonna need to use a bunch of materials in order to make your model. 
Okay, so what you can see here, I actually start, mine starts here, it's more shallow. So you can see this part that I colored in red. I just took a red marker, just a red washable marker. This is representing that continental shelf. So you can see it's relatively shallow here, right? So you can see it's becoming deeper as we go down. So actually, I think it's better if I show it to you this way. So here's my continental shelf. And then it becomes more sloping. This is our continental slope. This yellow part here is a part that was not on the uh, diagram that I showed you. This is a part of the continental slope that's called the continental rise. It's the part where it meets the abyssal plain. And, and the continental rise is interesting to discuss because this is where a lot of sediment accumulates. So you really get um, an interesting sediment profile of what life has existed there and what climate has existed there um, because we can use um, ocean floor sediment cores to look back at past climate and look back at past life forms that's a whole other uh that's a whole other webinar there and then you can see in green um that's the abyssal plain and then what I did is I just kind of took my finger and I just dug out a trench. You can see I, I made a trench in, in purple. And then I've got some abyssal plain over here. And then I added some seamounts. Those are those undersea volcano, those undersea mountains. And you can see those are in blue. So this is my seafloor model. Again, I made this uh, using salt dough um, because to me that seemed like the best way to make the model. But you know, I guess you could use Play-Doh, you could use model magic. You could use rocks and sand. I mean, there's a million ways that you could make the seafloor model. And I'd actually really love to see what y'all come up with. So um, when you make your seafloor models, um, I would love it if you would you know, take a snap of your seafloor model and, and send me an email with a picture of it and um, a description of how you made it. I think that would be really fun. Okay, so this is our seafloor model. So how are we going to simulate mapping this? So remember, as I said, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate single beam sonar mapping. So this is not how scientists map the seafloor now. They use that multi-beam sonar and the computer models to generate those uh, really beautiful maps. But I love this because it gives us a general idea of how this works. And it also um, is a great um, way to incorporate math, science, and some, some design, some design um, engineering skills. OK. So what you're going to need to do this is you're going to need something to simulate the surface of the water. So I decided to use aluminum foil. So you don't need to use aluminum foil. You could use a piece of butcher paper that would work or, you know, any piece of paper that would work. But I decided to use aluminum foil. And then what you're going to do is you're going to get a piece of one centimeter grid paper. And you're going to tape that one centimeter grid paper on top of your aluminum foil. You can, if you don't have one centimeter grid paper on hand, you can type into whatever search engine you use, one centimeter grid paper, and up will come a variety of options that you could use to um, print out your own one centimeter grid paper. So here is my aluminum foil with my one centimeter grid paper already attached to it. So I'm going to lay that down on my model like so. All right. And then I'm going to use some tape just to make sure that that's pretty securely taped on there because when I go to take my data, I can get some movement of my grid and I really don't want that to happen, although it will happen. So there's a little bit, you know, there's going to be a little bit of error in here, but that's okay because it gives us the general idea of what's going on and it's always useful to talk about, you know, um, why there may be error in a simulation or in something that you're doing. And so the reason um, I'm going to, I'm sorry, it's going to take me a couple more moments to really make sure this is nice and securely down here. Um, I didn't do this in advance because I wanted you to see the model before I started um, taking data on it. Um, another way that you could do this is you could, um, if you didn't want your learner to um, see the model before trying to map the model, because there is something, I guess, to be said for the discovery of you know, not knowing what's there. You know, I, I, I built this, so I know kind of what it's, what I was gonna get really when I, when I go to sample it. Um, that is something that could be, um, that could be fun is to have maybe one person build, two people build models and then switch them so that the person is mapping a model that they don't know exactly what it looks like. Um, and that way it's kind of a big reveal when you take the, um, the aluminum foil off and you can kind of see, oh, does my map, actually um, 
look like what is underneath there, but that's different than how I did it. Okay, so I've got that nice and secure, right? That's on there. Okay, so I'm gonna pause. Anybody have any questions for me so far? Everybody feeling good, following along? Okay. We're good? Yeah, it seems like so far so good. Okay, fantastic. All right, so there's multiple ways that you could do this. There's really no wrong way to do it. Um, this is how I decided to, to structure the activity and for, for ease. So if your learners are a little bit more advanced, you could um, pause here and you could say to them, well, how, how, do you, how do you think you wanna map this, right? Give them the ability to kind of design their own investigation for our purposes um, in the procedure that, um, that you'll get from us. Um, I'll, I'll show you the way that I did it. So what I decided to do is just take my ruler and I'm gonna just draw, I'm just gonna use a Sharpie just so you can see it better. I'm gonna draw a transect line from the edge of my, my, my grid to the other side all the way across parallel to the edges of my model. So this here closest to me is zero centimeters. And then I happen to know, because I know how big this grid paper is, that over here is 22 centimeters. So I've got zero centimeters here all the way to 22 centimeters, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take data starting at zero, one, two, three, so on and so forth, all the way across my transect, all the way to 22 centimeters. This isn't the only way to do it. This is the way that I decided to do it. So how are we gonna simulate this? Da 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 da, bamboo skewers. Well, I guess they don't need to be bamboo, but the ones I have are bamboo skewers. So this bamboo skewer is going to represent single beam sonar being sent down from a ship. So we've got an imaginary ship, driving this transect and at every centimeter along the way, sending down single beam sonar and measuring the time that it takes for that echo to return and then being able to calculate the depth. Make sense? So I have a method that I'm gonna to use to take data here. I shared this in the procedure that you are gonna be getting, but this is another opportunity where you could invite problem solving from your learner. You could say, how, do you, how are you gonna collect data? So what I decided I was gonna do, and so I'm gonna show you, cause I think it's just easier. I'm gonna show you just a point right here. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, right? Taking my probe and coming down through and pressing until I feel it hit my model. And I'm really working on making sure that I keep my, my probe straight up and down. And then I'm just gonna take a pencil cause I don't want it to perhaps slide down any slope that's on the model. And then I'm just gonna take a pencil and I'm just gonna mark. All right, make sure I've got a nice good mark. And then I'm gonna bring that up and then I can take my ruler. So you want a ruler with metric markings. So mine has both um, imperial markings and it has metric markings, but this is easier if we use metric. And then I'm just gonna take my ruler and I'm gonna measure to that mark. And I'm going to say, okay, that is 4.2 centimeters. So then I would write 4.2 here on my grid. All right. And then if we're going to use this method, which is the method that I found to be the easiest, you just take your handy dandy eraser. Make sure you erase it nicely. Okay. And then you can take your next data point. So again, when you're doing this with your learner, or if, if, you're, if you're a learner who's watching this yourself, right, you're gonna take data at zero all the way to the edge of your grid, which in my particular case was 22 data points. We're not gonna do that today for the sake of time. I'll just show you and I'll show you data that I've already taken from this model. So we'll just pick another spot, right? So here's my spot, right? So this is what I'm talking about in terms of making sure it's taped down. I probably could have taped it a little bit more for this so coming down through. Okay, making sure it's straight up and down, holding, marking. And then I'm able to measure that again using my ruler. So this is 7.2. And there's gonna be a little bit of error here, right? Um, because, you know, um, I might not have it 
taped exactly as tightly as I did the first time I did it, but you, you'll get the general idea, right? This is, um, is, this is not gonna be perfect in terms of accuracy, but um, it's a great simulation of how single beam sonar works. Okay, so that is what we would do. All right, so I'll pause again, any questions? No, we're feeling good? How do I make salto? Okay, yeah, so salto, just reg I use just regular white flour, um, regular iodized salt and water. So two cups of flour, one cup of salt, mix it in a big, in a big uh, bowl, and then add in the, the cup of warm water and mix it up. And then you just kind of mix it all together and you just get, it, it, it kind of ends up feeling like Play-Doh. So it's relatively easy to make. Um, it can be kind of sticky. So you definitely want to have um, some, some flour to kind of keep on your hands so that you can roll it up and you can, um, and you can manipulate it to make your model. Great question. Thank you so much. All right. So does this make oh, sense? Also, can I add, when you get your um, email with the recording and the instruction sheet, the PDF, she put the instructions for making Salto right in there like a rock star. I did. I did. But in case you wanted to visualize that now, it's super easy to make. I am I am not great in the kitchen. So if I can make Salto, I guarantee you uh, anyone, anyone can make Salto. All right, great. So let's take a look at what this looks like once we actually have all of the data ready to go. So let me get out of here. All right, and I wanna show you what this data actually looks like once we're ready to go. So can you guys see my screen? Caitlin, can you guys see my screen here? Um, I'm not seeing your screen, I'm still seeing your desk. Oh, rats, okay. That's unfortunate. Okay, let's see if we can figure out how to do this. It should be near the center at the there bottom. There How's you that? go, boom. If at first you don't succeed, right? Try, try, try again. Okay, so here is a scan of, a, of that data sheet, right? So you can see here are all of my points, right? So 2.2, .2. all of these numbers are actually negative. I just didn't write the negative sign because zero is the, um, is the surface, right? You can see I've got all these points here. These are all negative, right? I've got my, here's my deepest part, right? So that's my trench, right? Negative 6.8. All right, you can see I went and I took all 22 of those data points. All right, so now that I have that, I now can use that to make my, my sonograph, my echogram, right? So the easiest way that we can visualize the seafloor. So this is making a, a graph on a Cartesian plane. So X, Y graphing, um, figuring out the range of data, figuring out what increments you wanna use, um, using as much of the graph paper as you can to be able to really visualize this. So this is a really great opportunity to teach fundamental graphing on a Cartesian grid. What I decided to do was make my own graph paper so that it could make it a little bit easier for me, but you could do this just on um, any, any graph paper, any grid paper that you make. So what I did is I used um, uh, uh, Google Docs and I just inserted a table and I decided to make my table 22 rows, 22 columns across because I had 22 data points. And then I made it um, come down with eight rows. I could have made it only have uh, uh, seven rows because that would have included all my data. My, my deepest point was negative 6.8, but I decided to make it eight. So I made my own um, seafloor grid here, but you could absolutely just use a regular piece of graph paper. And then, so something that just looks like this, which is the same thing that we use to uh, run our transect data. So when I did that, I got something that looks like this. So all I've done here is I've taken this data and I've graphed it here. So this data point, this is zero on the transect line, but negative 2.2 of depth. This is one centimeter on the transect line, negative 2.2 of depth. So all I've done is I've graphed that here. So this is a great opportunity also to not only talk about the skills of graphing, but to talk about the requirements for a graph. So you can see here's my X axis. It's got a title, length of transect line, and I include my units, centimeters. We always wanna include units whenever we have a, a quantitative piece of data. Here's my depth also in centimeters. You can see I start at zero and it comes down here to negative eight. So all of my increments are equal. So this is negative one, so this is negative two. So if this distance is negative one, then 
this next distance, because it's the same, it also has to be the same increment. So this can't be negative one and this can't be negative four, right? So this is a great way to talk about consistency of increments within an axis. And um, I used to teach algebra, I'm a retired school teacher. I taught biology and algebra. And I will say I've spent a lot of time working with young people uh, on graphing and um, it's, it's a tough skill. So I, I would actually encourage uh, doing this by hand, graphing this by hand, although we'll talk about how you can use um, a graphing program if you want to, to add technology into the graph as well. So I would say do both of them if, you, if you're able to, but I do think being able to graph by hand is a really useful skill, not necessarily because one is going to use it all the time. I, I can't remember the last time I really graphed something by hand. Well, I graphed this by hand. That was the last time I did it, um, but because it, it helps a learner understand how a graph is generated and that adds context and meaning to it. It's not just like something magical that just, you know, fell out of the sky, right? Um, it's, it, it, they understand where it came from. And it also graphing really teaches um, numeracy and quantitative reasoning. So I, I think there's a lot, a lot to be said for graphing by hand. So here we have our, our, our labels for our x-axis and our y-axis. Here we have our title. Every graph should have a title, seafloor sonograph. I could make the argument um, that that could be a more descriptive title, but we'll, we'll go with it. And you can see what I did here, right? Here's zero, and then this is negative one, negative two, here's negative 2.2. So I had to estimate, right? So this is great, this is a numeral, numeral uh, logic, right? So if this is negative two and this is negative 2.3, right? Negative 2.2 would be here. And then I said, okay, at one centimeter, it was also negative 2.2. And then I found the next point for, ne for two centimeters. The next point for three centimeters. I graphed all 22 of those and then I connected those with a line. So now we can see, right, if you can picture in your mind's eye the seafloor model that I showed you a couple minutes ago, this sonograph really does represent that, that seafloor bathymetry, right? Remember, bathymetry is the word for topography under the water. So we've got our continental shelf, we've got our continental slope. We've got our abyssal plain, here's our trench. We've got maybe a couple of abyssal hills and then there's our seamount and then it drops off again. So you can see um, this really helps us model that, um, that, that seafloor profile. Okay, so that's your, that's your basic type of graphing. So I'll pause again, any, any questions about, about graphing, about, um, about this aspect of the activity? No? Okay, great. Um, actually, I have a quick question. Yeah, please. So how much time should one set aside for both the, you know, dropping of the, the bamboo rod or whatever your point makes? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much for asking. It depends on how many data points you want to take, right? So I decided that I wanted to be really detailed for my, um, for my sonograph because I really wanted to be able to show the the resolution, right? Because we, I don't have this huge model, right? So my changes have to happen relatively quickly in my model. And again, it'd be awesome. I would love to build a bathtub size seafloor model and really be able to, to show those changes uh, more gradually, but that just wasn't feasible for me. So it depends on how many data points you wanna take. I would say for me personally, to take all 22 of these data points, it took me maybe 15 minutes. So I would say um, that that is that's about how long I think maybe a little bit longer um, for no it took me about ten minutes so I would say maybe plan for maybe twenty minutes to take the data does that answer your question yes thank you fabulous and making the model uh, making the model overall I mean making Salto is really quick um, I would say it probably took me an hour to make the model and that's because I kept coming up with better ways I would you know I would. I would try something and then say, oh, I'm gonna make a seam out this way. And then I would make it and I'd say, oh no, you know, this, this is a better idea. So um, I think making the model uh, could, could, that could be an afternoon in itself um, and a really fun one, I think too. Okay, great questions. Thank you, everybody. Okay, now remember our second type of mapping is a contour map, a bathymetric map. So we need to have more data in order to be able to, to make our bathymetric map. And again, there's no one way to do this. This is the way that I decided to because I think it made it straightforward, but this is also another opportunity for you to, depending on the, um, the level of your learner, to say, 
to do some background on bathymetric maps. And um, if you are not super familiar with how to, with contour maps, so remember a bathymetric map is simply a contour map underwater. A topographic map is a contour map above water. If you're not super familiar with this aspect of, of the geosciences, there are some really great uh, online tutorials on how to draw ISO lines or contour maps. So an ISO line is a line that connects line, um, points of equal value. Um, there's some great online tutorials on how to draw those. Um, and so you can check that out. I will, I'll go over that with you. But if, if, you're, if you wanted to um, give your, your learner a little bit of background on bathymetric maps and contour lines first, and then sort of present this to them and say, your ultimate goal is to make a bathymetric map. How would you go about doing that? Um, that could be a really fun way to build in um, some advanced processing skills, right? To really have them be designing the experience, um, not simply following along with the experience. Although that's that's valuable as well. You know, I wanna, um, every learning activity can be scaffolded for learners of, of a variety of ages, right? So um, I think even, even a very young learner um, could get excited about making the seafloor model and about just maybe taking a couple data points and maybe you don't even graph at all. So, you know, there's always ways to, to riff, right? You know, um, it's, it's like good jazz, right? You can like always riff on it. Okay, so this is how I decided that um, it would be easiest to collect data for bathymetric map. So I'm going to take my ruler and I'm going to draw two more transects. So you can see I've kind of got it an equal. So I'm going to kind of split this one and I'm going to draw another transect going all the way across my grid. Sorry, it's a little wobbly. I should have taped it a little bit more tightly. So really, really getting that tape tightened down is gonna make it easier. And then I'm gonna draw another one over here. Okay, so again, I've got zero. So these are my zeros all the way to 22. And you might be thinking, oh no, I don't wanna have to take 44 more data points. No, you don't need to do that, but we're gonna do the same thing. Right, and so what I decided to do was every two centimeters. So here's one, two, right? So actually I started at zero and then every two centimeters on each one of these transect lines took a data point. So again, inserting down, making sure that it's nice and upright, marking with my pencil, bringing that out, using my ruler. And I've got 3.7. 3 so this would be my negative 3.7. And so then what I did is I just did this every two across, right? Every two centimeters, every two centimeters for both of these, giving me data running all the way across my sheet. And again, you can take fewer data points. You can take more. You could use a smaller box to give you fewer data points. Once you get going, this happens pretty quickly. I would say, anticipating this question, I would say to take all these data points every two across, right? Um, took me maybe uh, another another 10 minutes to take this data. So maybe this is something that you, you, know, you want to spread out over some time um, to keep the, the interest level um, raring to go. So taking this data across. So now let me show you what that looks like. So here's my um, sonograph. Oh, I just realized that I forgot to talk about this. We'll go back to this for a second. So if you want to, um, to use some, some graphing software, some graphing programs in order to do this, you can just import that data. So all I did was I just imported this data into a, I'm using uh, Google Sheets. So you can see here's my trans transect length, zero, negative 22. So I just put this in two columns and then I was able to use, I'm using Google Sheets, but you could use Excel um, to make that sonograph um, here uh, electronically, like letting the, graph, letting the graphing program do the heavy work for me. So again, you can see, looks very similar. It should, it's the same data. Oh, where's my, there it is, it was hiding for me, right? This and this look very similar. You can see, so that's another way that you can do it. All right, apologies, going out of order. So here's my full sample. You can see, so here's my original transect line. And then here's my data every two centimeters. So I started at zero and then every two centimeters across. All right, and so from this, I'm then able to draw a contour map 
And my contour map, I didn't draw all of it, ended up looking like this. So you can see these are my contour lines, right? So every point that's on one of these lines is of equal value. So this is my negative two centimeters contour line. So every point that's on this line is of equal depth. Every point that's on this line is of equal depth. These are my two. And then I decided to use red to color that contour range. So anything that's then colored red is a depth less than two centimeters. Here's my negative 2.5 contour line. So anything that's on this line is negative 2.5 centimeters in depth. And then between the negative two contour line and the negative 2.5 contour line, I decided to color that contour range orange to show that anything there is between negative two and negative 2.5. Here's my three, my three and a half, my four, and so on and so forth. So able to make that contour map. So I'll show you a little bit about how I actually did that here on my grid. So we'll do this relatively quickly. And so this is something that probably, um, if you're not familiar with how to do this, um, is something that you might want to do some um, further research into. And as I said, there are some great tutorials on how to make contour lines online. Um, maybe I'll put one of those together for you too. Okay, so you can see my lowest value here is negative 1.8. So, I'm going to start my first contour line at negative two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look here and I'm going to say, where on my map do I know that the depth of negative two exists? And I'm going to put an X there. So here is negative two. I know that because I actually have that data. Here is negative 2.2. So negative two, if I estimate, would be somewhere here off the grid. Here, this is negative 1.8. And this is negative 3.2. So negative 2 exists between there. But I have to estimate where that would be. And I'm going to say that that's going to be just generally right around there. OK. Now, I know that those points have equal depth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line, and I'm going to connect them. Now, some, this line, though, is going to go off the grid. So I'm going to draw that line like I'm connecting to this X that's off the grid. And I apologize, it's not super easy to draw lines with this annotate tool. And then I can draw this one going like that. And then contour lines always, they don't stop. They always have to extend to the edge. So we're going to make the, the assumption that straight across here, all that would be at a depth of negative two. All this coming this way, would also be at a depth of negative two. So that's my first contour line. That's my negative 2.0 contour line. And then what I decided to do further was then I then said, let me, oh, how do I change color? Well, I'm not sure how to change, oh, format. I think I can do that here. I decided to make this red, right? So I colored this whole contour range red on my original map, saying that anything that is shaded red here is going to be less than two. OK, so let's look at another one. So if this is negative two. I decided my next contour line was going to be negative 2.5. So I decided to go in half centimeter increments. You could go in full centimeter increments. I decided to go in, in half centimeter increments. So let's see, 2.5, right? So does 2.5 exist between 2 and 4? Yes, it does. I'm going to estimate that it's right around here. This is 2.2. This is also 2.2, 2.2, and 3.5, right? 2.5 exists right around here. Between 1.8 and 3.2, my 2.5 exists right around here. And then I can draw my ISO line connecting. Oh, hold on. I want to use a different, I want to use a finer. I can connect these two, these points with my ISO line, my contour line. And then again, contour lines don't stop, they extend to the end of the grid. Say everything from here is going to be negative 2.5. Everything from there is going to be negative 
So this is my negative 2.5 contour line. And I decided that I was going to make that orange, that this contour range was gonna be orange. So everything here was orange. Saying that everything in here is going to be between a depth of negative two and negative 2.5. And then I can continue that all the way up my con all the way throughout my my contour map and you can see that's what i did here in that map that we initially looked at right so you can see i went all the way here to my to my uh negative to my negative seven contour line and then if i had continued going the other way we'd find that it was getting shallow again oh i'm gonna erase here so that you can you can see this better when you annotate and then you change documents, it keeps your annotation. So that's how you can do um, a bathymetric map. All right. Okay, so that is the activity in a nutshell. Um, I can show, um, I see that we've got about nine minutes left in our time together. And so Kaylin, is it time to turn it over to, to Q&A? Yes, absolutely. So if uh, anybody has some questions, please go ahead and put them in the, the box. We've kind of been, we've actually been keeping up with them as we've gone along. So uh, there's not a whole lot hanging out there right now, but I would like to uh, reiterate Aaron's comment and say that this is in fact so cool. I, oh good, I'm so glad that you guys enjoyed it. I actually had a, I had a blast doing it. So um, hopefully that your learners will have a good time doing it. Um, so thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I saw somebody popping up saying, what's the purpose of the aluminum foil? Great, great question. So I decided to use aluminum foil to represent the surface of the water. And then I put the grid on top of it. Um, I put the grid on top of it. And the reason that um, I did that was because um, this gives you an option that if you wanted the seafloor model to be kind of a mystery from whoever is mapping it, because I do think there is a little bit of something that's like taken away when you kind of like know what it looks like. You're like, not surprised, like, oh, I kind of know there's going to be a deep area there. Um, but it's kind of, I can see it'd be kind of exciting when it's like, oh, it's shallow. Oh, it's deep. Right. Um, and so the aluminum foil is a way to obscure that from whoever is doing the mapping so that then you could take the map off leaving the aluminum foil and then later have like the big reveal of what the seafloor map actually looks like. I wasn't able to do that. I tried to convince my husband to build the seafloor model without me seeing it so that I could be surprised, but I was not, I was not able to convince him to do that. Actually, he would have happily have done that, but he was out of town on business. Um, so, you know, that might be an option for you. It might not be right because, you know, um, maybe I actually learned a lot from making the model myself too. So I do think there's something to be said for, you know, a kiddo making the model because you learn that way, right? You're going to, you're going to have a much better encoding in your brain of what a seamount is. Once you've like gotten your hands in the salt dough and made a seamount, right? You're going to have a much better encoding in your brain of what a trench is once you've actually taken your finger and threw the salt dough and made a trench. So um, that's what the aluminum foil is there for. I also think that even, um, I think it gives a little bit of a robustness to the model as well, because I do think that without the aluminum foil, just putting the bamboo skewer probe down through the grid paper, um, I think might, might cause it to rip a little bit. So that's what the aluminum foil is for. So hopefully that answers your question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I love, um, I love teaching marine science. I love teaching science. I mean, I'm a huge, I'm a huge science nerd. So I get really uh, jazzed and enthusiastic about this kind of stuff, because I just think it's really important. And it's really fun. So uh, hopefully, um, hopefully, you guys have had fun too. And, and hopefully you'll have fun doing this. Um, and please, if you went if not, not if when, when you tackle this, I would love to hear um, how it went for you. And if you have any, um, if you have any feedback, because uh, this is not, um, I haven't beta tested this with with actual live students It's simply just me um, doing it. So I would love to see what this is like, um, actually done with real live um, real life children. So <laughs> please, uh, please keep me posted. Um, and again, you know, this is just a sample of some of the things that Ocean First Education has out there for you. Um, we are really, really passionate about 
bringing marine science into the standard science curriculum because the ocean is super important and um, it's not doing so great right now. Um, and, uh, you know, just if we can get people to understand the ocean better and to realize its importance and really care about it, uh, we can do really magical things to conserve it. Yes, question. I see we have a question. Somebody has a question? Um, oh, I thought I saw somebody that says, I have a question. Yeah, no. Um, hopefully, uh, it was Aaron who said they have a question. Aaron, we were waiting for you to type it back in. So we'll give you a second to do that. I'm assuming they mean, how do you get all this data? How do you get all this data? Um, in terms of, so how did, how did we get the data in order to make the map? Yeah. Okay. So remember that came from, um, our actual using the bamboo skewers to measure the depth. And then we wrote that down on the grid. So that data that I used to graph is actually coming straight from the grid. So I can show you that one more time. Maybe that was, maybe that wasn't clear. Right, so here is the grid. This is all, I took all this data. So I took 22, 33, I took 44 points worth of data, right? To get all of this information in order to make the bathymetric map. I didn't think that y'all wanted to sit here and watch me poke the paper 44 times. So we kind of did it like TV cooking, right? Um, and so that's where that data came from, right? So this was our first transect. You can see here's our first transect, right? That I showed you how to do. And then that's what I used to make this. And then once I had that full data set, all 44 points of data there, I used that to make this. So hopefully that clarifies. I didn't show you all, all of that because I thought you guys would be like, right? Um, that would be like sort of watching paint dry. Although it's very satisfying to do it. You get this kind of like very satisfying thunk. Um, so I think, I think your learners will, will enjoy doing that. Um, and you can always take more data points. Um, and you can always take fewer data points as well. It, it depends. If you take fewer data points, you're not going to get as much resolution, but that's, you know, that's okay. Then that's something to talk about, right? That's part of the scientific process, right? That's then saying, well, why, why, why does it not look exactly like this? Well, if we, we, we weren't able to capture as much resolution because we didn't take as many data points. So um, there's always, always things to, to, to discuss. Oh, Kaylin, you're muted. Sorry about that. Would you recommend taking all of the data points straight from the get go, or would you say like do a little bit, do a little mapping? You That's know, a great question. Engage. I would say split it up. So I would say do your transect first, and then make the sonograph, and then really have that be part of it. And then maybe to talk a little bit about bathymetric maps and contour mapping, and then say okay, let's take the data to do the contour map, and then do the contour mapping. And even within that, if you have a learner that you know is if they're losing interest in taking the data points, because you know, I mean, you gotta, you gotta take the data, right? Um, if they're losing interest in that, then that can be something that you can chunk. Um, you could even as the facilitator of learning, like you could take the data points yourself and, and the majority of them yourself and have your learner take only a few of them. And that way you kind of get the best of both worlds. You're capitalizing on the finite attention. Like, Cause like, we all have finite attention spans, right? Like we do, you know? And so that way you're, you're still getting the robustness of the data but you're doing it in a way that is realistic in terms of the attention span of your, of your, of your learner. So that would be my recommendation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. This is like absolutely fascinating. Um, I really enjoyed it. It seems like a lot of our attendees are very excited to do this in their own home. So um, we would love to see what you come up with. So take yes. pictures, send it to us on Facebook, send it to us via our contact us page. And we'll share it with everyone. Um, it'd be very cool to get that out there. Um, and then I wanted to remind everybody that Ocean First is available at the co-op. Um, it is 25% off, uh, so come and get, they have so many awesome gorges. There's marine life and uh, Caribbean fish mm -hmm. and just like a great array of really, really cool things that you can bring into your home school. And today only we're offering smart points on them. So if this is something you're interested in, today's a great day to uh, go ahead and get that and bring it into your home school. Fred. Thank you so, so much. I oh, my pleasure. This has been so fun. Thank you, everybody.
great. Um, and we appreciate all of you for sharing a little bit of your time with us today. Thank you. Have thank a wonderful you. rest of your day. Take care. Be well, everyone. Bye.